Okay, folks. Uh, let's get started. Let me just make sure I said record. So, um, how's the lab checkout going for people? Slow. <laughs> so, so um, let me start by just reiterating what I've said to some of you in lab already, which is that we have discovered that this week's lab checkout is a bit challenging, which is okay. Um, but what that has meant is that there's a relatively large number of groups, not all groups, but a, but a relatively large number that haven't quite made the lab checkout for this week. Um, this is, it means a few things. Uh, one of the things that I'll just remind you of is that this is sort of one of the joys of being the guinea pig group. Uh, it's difficult to tell how difficult a lab checkout is until we stress test it with a group of students. So maybe it's a little bit challenging. Uh, maybe it's also a reminder for some folks the importance of coming to lab with a plan ready to go. I know that some of you did and still didn't meet the lab checkout, which is perhaps an indication that this one's a little challenging. I, that's okay, but um, so let me just say that that's totally fine. We'll just adapt a little bit. And the plan is I'm going to spend some time today talking through some of the details of this week's checkout um, a little bit more specifically. And I also made certain that we have time today. So we can just talk about questions that folks have. Um, there's not really a specific set of content I want to get through. I just want to talk through questions that folks might have. Um, the other thing that I'll mention, and hopefully you all saw this on Canvas, is I opened up extra lab hours on Monday and Tuesday. So folks are welcome to come to the Monday, Tuesday lab hours and wrap up this week's lab section. I'll remind you all also that you're all welcome to come to any lab section. And by the way, you should. Um, if you come to just one lab section per week and you're not working at home, it might be a little bit difficult for the remaining checkouts to get things done. Um, so you're welcome to come to any of the lab sections with the one caveat that I'd ask you to maybe not come to the Wednesday night one if you're not enrolled in that section because next week starts our cohabitation with 2300, uh, which means it is going to be steaming in there. I think every seat is occupied. They've calculated it so that every seat is occupied. Uh, so that one maybe, <laughs> maybe avoid if you're not enrolled in it. But any of the other ones, there's plenty of empty benches and folks can come and work. Um, Okay, so so I want to talk through cricket stuff. Before I do, does anyone have any questions? Questions about things like maybe direct digital synthesis or proto threads or the ADC or anything of this variety? Are there any concepts or techniques or anything so far that folks are finding a little bit confusing when they're sitting down to work on stuff? It's all just beautifully, perfectly clear. <laughs> okay, what, why don't we do this? Um, I'm gonna talk through some cricket stuff and perhaps as I, I'll get through this before the end of the lab. At the end of the lab, I'll ask that question again and perhaps by then some things that you might wanna ask uh, will come to mind. So the way that I'd like to do this is let me pull up one of the demo the the examples from which you're starting this week and in particular i'm going to pull up the um the fft demo so let's see here by the way i've seen a pretty interesting bug in a few lab groups when they try to run this fft and the bug that i've seen is it renders on the vga screen looks like an FFT with a big old spike at 60 hertz. What is that? Some of you know because we've talked about it in lab. Yeah. It mains power? It is, yeah. So what, what this is probably indicating is that the microphone is not hooked up properly. And so instead of having a microphone hooked up to the analog to digital converter, you might have a disconnected jumper, which is an antenna, essentially. And what you're picking up is the oscillating AC current in the walls around us, which here in the United States, AC currents at 60 hertz. So that big old spike that you see at 60 hertz is 
the stuff in the walls around you and you're picking it up as an antenna with a jumper cable, which is kind of just interesting in its own right. Um, and then once you get it hooked up properly, the, the FFT should look much more sort of bubbly and flat and will respond whenever you speak into it or play a tone into it. Um, so, so what I want to talk through is, let me see here. What I want to talk through is, let me, let me first remind you of the objective for this week. Um, the goal for this week is, in last week's checkout, by the end of last week, what you had was a system that could generate two totally independent, crack, independent <coughs> crickets, one out of core zero, one out of core one. They don't know anything about the other one. They're truly independent. The goal for this week is to combine your code from last week from this example, which runs an FFT, and to use that FFT to listen for the presence of a cricket. And when you hear a cricket, you have to decide whether core zero will register the cricket that was detected as being a legitimate chirp that it will ultimately have to react to, whether the same is core for, for whether the same is true for core one, whether it's true for both or whether it's true for neither. With that, another way of, of phrasing that is you want for each core, the cricket on each core to hear all the chirps that it didn't make. Right. And like all of the projects in this course, you could accomplish that goal in a variety of different ways. And I've seen people going at this using a few different strategies. I want to talk through a particular strategy that you might consider. Um, which is not to say that it's the best one. You might come up with a better one, um, but it's one that you might consider. So, so the way that you could model what's going on, I think, I think an appropriate way to think about this is there's three processes occurring. There's the cricket being generated out of core zero, there's the cricket being generated out of core one, and there's an FFT. And there, some of you have, have taken the strategy of deploying an FFT on both cores, and that could work. I think you have to be a little bit careful in that case about um, negotiation between the cores about who's firing off the ADC when. You could set it up that way. I don't think that you actually have to. So. One, one arrangement for your code that you might consider is that you have a single thread on one of the cores, perhaps it's on core zero, as it is in this example. And what that thread does is gather a batch of ADC samples, compute the FFT, that's what's going on here. It's gathering a batch of ADC samples, computing the FFT, going through and figuring out which, which frequency contains maximum power in that FFT. And then you would have some logic beneath this line that says, is the frequency with max power the one associated with crickets chirping or one very nearby the one associated with crickets chirping? In which case, you could confidently say, OK, there is a cricket present in this batch of ADC samples. So that's just the presence of a cricket. The next thing the thread could do is query core 0 and say, core 0, did you produce this cricket chirp or is it possible that you produce this cricket chirp? And the way that it would get the answer to that question is by looking at the state variables for core zero's interrupt service routine state machine that's generating cricket chirps. So that's stored in, glo that's stored in global space, right? Those state, those state variables are global. So from a thread, you can access those variables and say, is core zero in a chirp producing state? If the answer to that question is yes, then that chirp that you detected won't register as a detection by core zero because it's possible that it produced the chirp and we don't want for it to detect its own chirps. It could then query core one because core one, even though that interrupt service routine is running on the other core, its state variables are also stored globally. So this thread on core zero can also access core one state. And it can ask core one, did you produce this cricket chirp? And core one will respond either yes or no. And so you detect a cricket, you ask core zero, did you produce a chirp? You ask core one, did you produce a chirp? The answer from either of them might be yes or no. In the case that they're synchronized or close to synchronized, then they both might respond yes. I was producing a chirp during the amount of, the, the, during the time that this buffer was gathered, in which case neither core would register a detection 
because next week, you know, when we implement the synchronization algorithm, we're registering detection so that we can take an action in response to affect synchronization. If we're already synced, we don't want to take an action, right? So if they, if they both respond that they were chirping, then neither registers a chirp detected. Alternatively, if core zero was chirping and core one wasn't, then core zero will not detect a chirp and core one will. It has heard the other core. Alternatively, again, it may be the case that I walk up with my phone and play crickets, in which case both cores will report, I was not producing a chirp, but I heard one. And they would both register a cricket detection. And next week, they would both take some action to affect synchronization with the cricket that I'm playing from my phone. There's a, there's, a, there's a slight complication here that some of you have noticed, which is, unless you change anything about this example, the ADC that we're gathering, we're, we're, or the, I'm sorry, the, uh, the FFT that we're performing, we're performing it on a batch of 1,024 samples from the ADC. And we've configured that ADC to gather samples at 10 kilohertz. So that means the total time to fill up that batch of samples is 1 over 10,000 times 1024, which is approximately, oh my god, what, like 10 hertz or something? Something like that? It, it's relative to the other processes going on here. It's quite a long time, actually, from the start of gathering these samples to the end of gathering these samples. So it is entirely possible that while you were gathering the samples, the state within your cricket generating state machines has changed, right? Maybe you, you measure this max frequency, you say, ah, oh, there's, there's a chirp present here. Let me go ask core zero if core zero generated this chirp. And core zero might report, oh, I'm in the paused state actually, but it wasn't in the paused state when you gathered those samples, right? So what you have in that batch is that there's a, there's a desynchronization here. You're looking at samples that you gathered a little bit ago and then asking each core what its present state is, which could introduce a bug. And the bug that that might look like is something like um, if you are detecting chirps as either generated by core one or core zero or some other cricket that's neither, you would get a lot of neithers, perhaps, in that case. There are a few ways you might solve this problem. One way that you might consider doing it is to remember that because we have we're sampling the ADC from a DMA channel. And we start gathering those samples in line 240 when we start the DMA channel. So you could, right before you start gathering the samples, you ask the cores, first of all, what states are you in? And second of all, how much longer will you be in those states? So it's an additional piece of information. You access that information incidentally by accessing the value of that incrementing variable that you're using to affect your state transitions in the interrupt state machine, right? So you might ask core zero what state you're in and it will report, oh, I am currently paused. I am not generating any cricket chirps, but I'm going to transition states in two cycles, in, in two more interrupts, which means that you can expect to find my chirp in this batch of samples that you're about to gather, right? So before you even start gathering the samples by querying each core for its state and how much longer it will remain in that state, you can know before you even start gathering the samples whether or not to ex expect to find a chirp from core zero or a chirp from core one in that batch of samples. So that by the time you go through and detect whether or not there's a chirp there, you, you can know whether or not to register that as a detection for core zero or core one. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah. How many samples, like, between the next chirp will it be detected? Like, if you know there's, like, two, two left, like, how many, what's, like, the maximum number? Like, how many, how many samples for which a chirp was playing do there need to be in the buffer in order to measure a cricket as being in the... Yeah, yeah. What a good question. I don't know. Don't know the answer to that. Bruce, do you know? You're going to get a bigger spike. You're going to get a more obvious spike at 2300, the more cricket call there is, so to speak. So one possibility would be to look at a ratio between the amplitude at 2300 and the amplitude every place else. 
If the ratio is only two to one, it's probably not much energy in there from the cricket. If it's 10 to one, it's got a lot of energy from the cricket, and therefore a lot of time overlap. Another clarification I'll make, a question that I've gotten a, a number of times is, um, if you, if you think about the relative timing here, so part of what makes this project interesting and challenging is we have multiple processes with different timing requirements, some of which are very strict and some of which are less strict. So for instance, audio synthesis, we have a very strict timing requirement there. 40,000 times a second, we have to send new samples to the deck. Same with the ADC incidentally. We wanna sample that ADC at precisely 10 kilohertz, which we're doing by Making, making use of these hardware peripherals. We've set up DMA channels to do this so that we can guarantee timing. But if you think about the relative um, lengths of these processes, it could be the case that in, in the length of one chirp, you gather maybe four or five, you compute maybe four or five separate FFTs. And if you're not careful, you could trick yourself into thinking, oh, I've just detected four or five cricket chirps, but actually I've only detected one. That's just me measuring the same chirp a bunch of times subsequently. So there needs to be a little bit of additional logic that says, okay, if I detected a cricket, I am not allowed to detect another cricket for a brief amount of time, for about how long a chirp lasts. How might you do that? That, that too, there's a variety of solutions to this. Um, one, may, one way you might do it is you say, I measured a cricket. Let me go grab the time off that 32-bit incrementing timer. It's a microsecond timer. And you say, OK, a cricket chirp lasts this many microseconds. I am not allowed, even if we go through this process a few more times and, and I measure the presence of a cricket chirp, I'm not, this core is not allowed to register that as a detection until it checks the value of the 32-bit timer and it has exceeded some threshold that you set when you detected the first cricket, right? Then you can actually, you can, you can tune this in units of microseconds. And you could, you could do this in other ways too that are perhaps a little bit less, uh, it's a little, you can make slightly less guarantees about the timing, things like software delays and stuff like this, which I don't generally recommend. Um, this could introduce something that I've gotten another question about, which is, okay, suppose I measure the presence of a chirp, but it's actually towards the end of that chirp. And I say, well, now you're not allowed to detect another chirp for a certain amount of time. But in that time, perhaps this chirp ended and another chirp began. That means that, you know, maybe I should detect that. Um, I'm okay with that, actually. So what, what this is going to mean is, what I'm saying is you do not have to detect the moment that a chirp starts. You don't have to detect chirp start. You just have to detect chirp presence. So next week, when you put up your two cricket chirps on the oscilloscope and we watch synchronization occur, the, because we're not detecting the start of the cricket chirps, the moment that they start, what we should not expect to see is perfect phase alignment. They won't line up to within the cycle. What we'll see instead is that they line up to within the length of a chirp, and they may slide back and forth like this a little bit, but they will stay within a chirp length of one another. The reason, I, I'm okay with that for a couple of reasons. First of all, it sounds synchronized. To our ears, it sounds, that little bit of desynchronization to within the length of a chirp, you're not gonna detect with your ears. Furthermore, we're building this whole system to model real crickets, real biological systems they have reaction times. The real crickets, I, I don't know this for certain, but I'll bet they're only synchronizing to within about the length of a chirp, right? So to the extent that we're trying to realistically model actual crickets, synchronizing to within this much is reasonable. It is, it is likely not the case that the crickets are synchronizing to within the 125 millionth of a second, right? Which, by the way, if you had some mechanism for signaling, I am starting the, the, the chirp this cycle, you could do that. You could synchronize them that much. We're not, we're not doing that. We're synchronizing to within the length of a chirp. And if we, if, 
if you get that working with your two crickets and you bring in the group next to use crickets and we, we scope all of them and somehow look at the phase of all of them, we'll see that all of them remain synced to within about the length of a chirp. That's okay. Questions? Yeah. What if you shorten the FFT? If you shorten the FFT, you will, I would think that you would get better synchronization because you would, with greater resolution, you'd be able to see the, the, the start of a cricket chirp. Folks could try this. Right now, the FFTs are 1,024 samples long. The only reason for that, by the way, is, um, as you may know, or as you likely do know, if you're generating the FFT off of purely real valued data, in the case, which we are, we're sampling audio, you compute the FFT, that FFT will, will contain information from zero hertz up to the, the, the sampling rate over two. And it's mirrored about the middle sample. So in the FFT that we're computing, in the, in the power spectrum that we're computing, if we gather 500 or 1,024 samples, the data that we care about is contained, will be contained within 512 of those samples of the output. I'm not articulating that particularly well. But what, the, what I'm saying is that the only reason I've chosen that length of the FFT is the VGA screen is, six, screen is 640 bits or pixels wide, rather. So 512 fits kind of nicely on the screen. That's as much thought went into it. <laughs> It just looks nice. So you are more than welcome to change that if you, if you so desire. How would you detect the start of a cricket if you wanted to? Yeah. I think you could wait to hear no chirp and then wait until you see like a rising edge on whether or not there's a chirp. The issue is that with overlapping crickets, you see constant high, but yeah. Yeah, something of this variety. You need to do something time domain. Right, because when you when you do the the Fourier transform, you lose time information in there. So something time domain has to happen. Bruce, the one problem with going with just a single rising edge is it's noisy. Yeah. So you have to do something to deal with noise. There's ways to deal, but you're quite right. Yes. Uh, can you explain a little more how the microphone sample the audio? Because uh, is it? like uh, keep sampling and after we uh, we run to the DMA channel start line then we just uh, get the time range out of that sample or just uh, it will sample you know kind of interval um, let me give you an answer and then you can let me know if this answers your question or not <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to answer the question I think you asked so so the way that the microphone is working if we take this all the way to the sort of the edge here, the way that a microphone works is there's a small diaphragm in there. And when pressure waves in the air hit that diaphragm, it makes the diaphragm wiggle back and forth. So this is the physical process that's taking place in an actual microphone is pressure waves from sound are propagating through the air, hitting this diaphragm, and the diaphragm wiggles. Those, those wiggles of the diaphragm are exciting small voltages. We're, we're measuring the displacement of that diaphragm as a voltage, which then gets amplified. So the ADC is sampling. When the ADC samples the, the signal out of the microphone, what it's really sampling sort of is the position of this diaphragm. And what we've done is configure a DMA channel to go sample the ADC, which is to say, go see where that diaphragm is positioned 10,000 times a second. We've chosen 10,000 times a second. Um, we, we could have chosen other numbers. We have some constraints on the rate with which we sample that diaphragm position because we're trying to measure oscillations of that diaphragm of a specific frequency, 2300 hertz. In order to do that, the Nyquist sampling theorem says, okay, we, we have to sample this at at least twice that rate. And we're gonna add some buffer just to make sure we're, we're well clear of that uh, sampling limit. Um, 
when we fire off this DMA channel, the 1,024 samples that get gathered, that timing is, is essentially guaranteed. So it is, we have set up that timing by configuring the, the timer that the DMA channels are paced by. We've configured them so that every time this timer counts, um, you know, one over 10,000 seconds, it fires off another DMA transfer. Those DMA transfers happen very quickly within a cycle or two, really. So we can guarantee that that batch of samples, the timing with which those samples was gathered was evenly spaced at 10 kilohertz. Now the amount of time between batches of samples is a little bit sloppier because what we're doing is gathering that batch of samples. We are, um, we are computing the FFT on them. Hold on a second, sorry, sorry, sorry. We, we are, uh, we're starting the, the, the gathering of the data here. This DMA channel, incidentally, when it gathers samples, it's putting those samples into a character array that we've called, um, that we've called sample array. So the DMA channel fills up this character array with the new set of samples. So what we do is we wait for it to finish filling up that batch of samples. We then copy the samples from that array into a separate array and window it incidentally, since we're doing an FFT, but okay, we copy the samples into a separate array. Once we've done that, we, we can start filling up this array with the next batch of samples. Meanwhile, while, while that batch of samples is being gathered, we can do math on the previously gathered batch of samples. So some things, there are things happening simultaneously here. Once we start this channel, behind the scenes, the DMA channel is, is filling up that next batch of samples at 10 kilohertz. Meanwhile, we are computing the FFT on the previously gathered batch of samples. In the event that we get through this math faster than it takes for the DMA channel to fill up that batch of samples, we sit and wait for it to finish. And then we carry on and do it again. So the process is, start gathering samples. We, we start gathering samples. Once we've finished, we copy those samples over to a separate array and start gathering the next batch. And while that batch is being gathered, instead of just sitting around and waiting for it to finish, we do computation on the previously gathered batch. Does it have anything to do with the strength of the signal? Say, uh, now I am I, uh, I'm pulse and no chirping. So it's just blocking or it will steal, you know, samples from the microphone, but it's just noise. It, it samples from the microphone. Um, the sampling of the microphone and the FFT knows absolutely nothing about what the crickets are doing. We're gathering the FFT, we're gathering these samples and computing the FFT no matter what. If we detect a cricket chirp, then we ask, okay, was this you core zero, was this you core one, or was it neither of you? And then you take some action. But in, in, in the part of this process where we're just gathering data, we're gathering data no matter what's going on, no matter what either of the crickets are doing, because it may be the case that the group across the lab is generating a cricket that we want to synchronize to. By the way, um, so we have noticed that debugging can get a little bit difficult in lab when there are lots of crickets going. Change your chirp frequency and you can make your cricket, just for testing, make your cricket chirp at, oh, I don't know, 1500 hertz. And then as, instead of associating 2300 hertz with the frequency that a cricket lives at, make it 1500 hertz, right? We can do sort of in lab frequency division multiple access just for testing and then put everybody back on the same frequency when we get to the check out next week. That was Harris's idea. Thank you, Harris. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's the frequency of your like running the loop and doing the FFT? How fast does this whole thing execute? Yeah. I don't know. Bruce? So the, the, the pace setter here is how fast you get samples, right? It takes it to, uh, 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 one eighth of a second to get a thousand samples of children. The question is, can you do an FFT faster than eighth of a second? And the answer is way faster, like a factor of 20 faster. Which is to say that we will 
sit here and wait each time through this loop for the next batch of samples to be gathered. Make sense? Okay. Which means if you want to get carried away, you can sit there and wait while sampling the ADC to see when the chirp starts. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> other questions about this stuff? I, I wrote down some other bugs that I've seen just to talk through. Let's see. Um, so, so this week, one of the things that you're tasked with doing is you're asked to merge your stuff from last week with this FFT demo from this week. And what a lot of you are discovering is that, that merge sometimes non-trivial. It's a really good thing to practice, which is why I'm asking you to do it. Because when you get to final projects, you're likely going to want to include some stuff from over here and some stuff from over here. So it's good to get practice with merging these things. But it's tricky. And one of the things that, that some of you have discovered the hard way, unfortunately, is it's real dangerous to copy paste code on these systems real dangerous. <laughs> um, the reason for that is on these systems, your software, you, you know, you're, you're making calls to SDK functions here. As we've talked about a, a million times at this point, all that those SDK function calls are doing is abstracting register manipulations. Those registers are controlling actual no kidding hardware, right? So if you, if you make an error copy pasting code here, it, it is, at best, maybe nothing happens. And at worst, you could do some legitimate, you could screw things up internally, right? You can, you can mess up the hardware. So you gotta be really careful copy pasting, which is not to say that you can't copy paste. What it means is that you have to do so thoughtfully. So when you're merging last week's code with this week's code, the strategy by which you do this is you consider a section of code and you ask yourself, what is this section of code doing? You ask, are there any contentions with the other code that I'm merging this with? Is it safe for me to merge this? What do I have to change about it in order to make this safe? And you go through and you move over the sections of, the, of last week's code of the previous example that you need to retain for this week, which is not all of it. In last week's multi-test code, you were generating the two cricket chirps and you may recall that there were two threads. There was a thread on each core that were semaphore ping-ponging back and forth. Those existed to show you how to set up threads, ping pong them back and forth. You don't need to retain those. You don't need to migrate those threads over to this week's checkoff. What you need to migrate is the cricket synthesis stuff. So you'll need to migrate the interrupt service routines. You'll need to migrate the global variables that those interrupt service routines use and manipulate. And you'll need to migrate the logic in, the, the, in main on Cora 1 or you'll need to migrate the logic on cores zero and one that set up the repeating timer interrupts that actually generate those crickets. That's the stuff that needs to get migrated. Those two threads you don't actually need. You will need some version of the thread in the FFT example. Right? You'll have to augment it, right? Because all this is doing is computing an FFT and you're trying to use an FFT to detect crickets. So there's extra stuff that has to be added, but you don't need to migrate everything. Um, you can do so thoughtfully, figure out what you need to retain and what you can leave behind. When you do that migration, one of the gotchas, as folks will have noticed, is these two examples have differences in their includes. The, the example from last week includes, for instance, uh, it has the hardware sync, for example, hardware interface library. And this has, this includes hardware interface libraries that the example from last week doesn't include. So the other thing that you have to merge and resolve here is we have to make sure that we have all the includes that we need for all the stuff that we've migrated over to this new example. So that means including that stuff here in your source file. It also means updating the CMake file. This, uh, oops, sorry. This is an easy thing to forget, as some folks have noticed. But if we go back here and take a look at the CMake file for the FFT example, just as an example, you can see that 
it would be executable name. Um, this is stuff associated with the VGA driver, which I'll talk about in detail in maybe a week or two. And we list the sources that we're going to include in this project. In this case, we're including the source file fft.c. This is the one that contains main and our threads and our interrupts, or the code that we wrote. And we're also including VGA graphics.c in this example, which is the um, contains all of the graphics primitives that we're using to draw to the VGA screen. And then importantly, we have this link libraries, which includes all of the SDK libraries that we want to include in this project. And if you're adding additional SDK libraries to your code in order to merge these two examples, those additional libraries need to be reflected in this list as well. Um, the symptom of forgetting to do that is, is pretty clear, actually. When you go to build, it will say something like, uh, can't find this library or something like that. When you see that, that is your indication that, oops, I forgot to add it to this list here. Okay. It's an easy fix, but it's just an easy thing to forget. Any other merge issues that folks have had? Okay. Yeah. Uh, in this uh, CMake list uh, file, uh, what's a private doing? Like, we didn't see that. Happen. So the private is, um, it's something that, if it's missing from some of the examples in that demo repository, it's, it's a mistake on my part. It's good practice to include. But what this is saying is, suppose that we have other projects contained in this, other projects contained in this repository of demos that have a source file called fft.c or that include a VGA graphics.c. Um, this is indicating that we would like for the compiler to please just look at the ones that are stored here locally when compiling this project. So it keeps the compiler from getting confused about which files it's supposed to be using. Um, it's one of those ones that, it, this one can lead to bugs that are slightly subtle because for one project where it has unique names for all of its files, it works just fine. It, doesn't, it knows exactly what you're talking about. For other ones where perhaps you've modeled your code off of demo code that includes some of the same file names, it can give some, some slightly obscure error messages. So that's what that's for. Okay. Other thoughts? FFT is fun to play with, isn't it? Play, play a violin sound into it. Yeah. Uh, earlier you mentioned merging the code from last week into the FFT. Um, the way our group said it was we did it the other way around. That's fine, right? That's totally fine. And it's not, it's not actually obvious to me which way is easier. Um, either direction works just fine. Okay, I had some other things written down that I've just been noticing. Let's see. So uh, one thing that I just wanted to clarify because I, I realized that I hadn't in the past is um, a few lectures ago, we talked about these mechanisms for controlling access to shared resources between the cores, these spin locks, right? So if both cores want to access a global variable, it's a mechanism by which one can say, I'm working on this right now, please don't work on it. And then the other one can access it. Does it bother anyone that both of your interrupt service routines are doing SPI writes without knowing if the other one's doing an SPI write? Isn't that a shared resource that we should be controlling access to? It's more like overriding other stuff. Yeah, yes, it's, the answer to that question is yes. And when I was starting to play with this system, I was trying to force contention to figure out what that looked like, and I couldn't get contention to occur. And then I read the data sheet. And what you find out is that there's a FIFO attached to the SPI. So when you do an SPI write, you're writing to a FIFO. I think it's eight samples deep. So if both core zero and core one try to write to the SPI channel, one just writes to the first element of the FIFO, the other writes to the second element of the FIFO, and it does the two transactions, one right after the other. And so it just works out. We don't have to control access to the SPI channel in this particular application. That's why you don't see spin lock controlled access to the SPI rights. 
if that FIFO didn't exist, then we would have to worry about this. We would have to control access. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is uh, uh, many groups have gotten this figured out, but um, it's something that I realized I didn't document well enough in the lab write up. I'm asking you, you, you may indicate that a chirp has occurred in a number of different ways. The way that I think I suggest you do it in the lab write up is to print to a serial terminal. In order to set up that serial connection, you will have to plug in that additional dongle that's included on all your kits. It's a blue dongle, a blue USB plug with four breakouts at the end. One of those breakouts is red, one is black, one's green, and one is white. And let me just clarify something quick. So first of all, unless you have removed it, there's a piece of tape on the red lead. That's to discourage you from connecting that to the Pico. That, uh, that contains the five volt power from USB, which depending where you put that into the Pico could cause some damage. So just don't connect that. And then the green and white are RX and TX for the, uh, for the UART channel. The, when you call in your code, sorry, I'm going back and forth between pages, but let me just show you something. When you call in your code, um, STDIO in it all. You can, you can look at the instantiation of this SDK function and it does a number of things. One of the things that it does is set up the default UART channel. The default UART channel is UART zero on pins one and two, GPIOs zero and one. So when you call STDIO in it all, it sets up UART. So that means you don't have to include the low level UART library. It's actually included by the high level library, Pico standard lib. So when you call STDIO in at all, UART is configured, it's set up. And all that you have to do is take the white lead and plug it into GPIO zero. That's either RX or TX. That would, well, it would be RX for the dongle. You take the green lead and plug it into GPIO one. That's the other data line and you take the black lead ground and plug it into pin three. You can then plug that into the PC and open up a serial terminal through PuTTY. I have discovered that you have to install a driver in order to get this to work. Forgot to do that. It's okay, it's, it's easy to do and I can show you how to do it. But in any case, you open up a serial connection through PuTTY to the Pico. The default baud rate is 115200. And then every time you call printf in your code, it'll appear on the serial terminal. Okay, you can alternatively, if you care to set up this serial connection to your own laptop. So lots of folks are opening serial connections to their own PC. Um, Tyler posted a notification on Canvas describing how you can set up this connection to a Mac through terminal. It's, it's quite easy actually. Um, you can do it through terminal on the Mac. The other way to do it, easy way to do it actually is through the Arduino IDE. It has the serial interface and it automatically detects which port something's plugged into. So that's quite a simple way to do it also. And probably most of you have that installed already. So uh, you could do it that way as well. Okay. I have a question for the class. Has anybody parked out debug information to the VGA? That's extremely fast. Much faster than the serial line. Yeah, that's something to remember. This, this is another bug that I wrote down to just remind folks of. So the baud rate for the UR channel is 115200. That's, that's bits per second, right? A character is eight bits, 10 bits. So uh, that means that per character, it costs you, what, like 10 microseconds? 100 microseconds. It's long, right? So when you call a printf with a string of text, that takes forever to print out. So something to avoid is putting print statements in an interrupt service routine, right? When you enter an interrupt service routine, you have a, you have a deadline. You have to get out of that interrupt service routine, particularly your cricket synthesizing timer callback functions. If you don't leave that in time, you're gonna try to take an interrupt from within an interrupt and the CPU locks up. It doesn't work. Um, so you can certainly put print statements down in, in your threads or in main with the understanding that every time you do that, 
it affects your timing considerably. So you can put them in places where that's okay, but it's something to be thoughtful about. Those print statements cost you a lot of time. The VGA screen, by contrast, it is um, perhaps requires a little bit more footwork to write text, clear text, write text. But writing to the VGA screen, I'm, I'm going to talk in detail through the VGA driver when we get to lab two. I think that's the appropriate time to talk about it. Um, but what I can tell you is that writing to the VGA looks to the CPU like, like modifying an array index. Say I want to write to pixel 50, 100. I go to a, a particular index in an array and modify its value, and that appears on the VGA screen. So we can write to the VGA as fast as we can change the value at a particular index in an array, which is very fast. Let me see what else I had written down. Let's see. Oh, another bug, another bug I've seen. And this, this one is, I get this bug because this is confusing. So um, in the FFT code, you will see that we are populating two arrays here. One's called sine wave and the other is called window. Window incidentally is our windowing function for computing the FFT. This is a Han window. And sine wave contains the amplitude of the amplitudes of a sine wave in fixed point and scaled over the number of samples that are going to be contained in the FFT. These are used in the computation of the FFT. In your multi-test code from last week, you populated a sine wave called, I think, sine table that you were using for direct digital synthesis, which it too contained the amplitudes of one period of a sine wave, but it was scaled over a different length. So when merging these things, you need for the FFT to work unmodified, you need to retain these arrays and their values. And you need to also make sure that you have that sign table that you're using for synthesis. Right? I can understand the confusion here because the sign tables sure look similar, right? So you'd think one works for the other. Um, you, you could set it up that way, but you'll want to retain your sign table that you're using for synthesis in addition to the sign table that we're using for computation of the FFT. Okay. Yeah. So no, we found out that they both use the same int ii. Um, so I have to change the variables for one of them. Nice. A good example of the risks of copy paste. <laughs> that 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 one's a subtle one. That that's reasonable not to catch. But yeah, uh, thank you for that. Um, Oh, some of you have also noticed another just uh, Hunter thing to watch out for. Apparently, in this entire document, the word frequency is consistently misspelled. <laughs> <laughs> it is a uh, free <laughs> frequency. Yeah. <laughs> so sorry about that. <laughs> but at least it's consistent. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, the, okay, we have three minutes remaining. The, the last thing that um, I won't talk about in tremendous detail, but I'll just point out because perhaps it's not exactly clear what's happening here is, uh, let me see, FFT. In this line here, so the output of the FFT gets stored in the arrays FR and FI, R standing for real, I standing for imaginary. And then when we actually plot the FFT, we're plotting the magnitudes of those complex numbers, which is to say the root sum of squares of the real part and the imaginary part. A root sum of squares is slow. So instead of computing the root sum of squares, this line here implements an algorithm that I'd encourage you to check out on Wikipedia called the alpha max plus beta min algorithm, where instead of calculating root sum of squares, what we do is we take the maximum of either the real part or the imaginary part and add to that the minimum of either the real part or the imaginary part, the other one, multiplied by 0 0.4. So we're replacing a root sum of square with a fixed point multiply, which is fast. That's a, an integer multiply. 
and an add. This costs us some accuracy. This is accurate to within, depending what number you choose here. And uh, you can have a coefficient on the max part as well if you care to. Depending what you choose for those coefficients, that can be as good as four-ish percent. This is a little sloppier, right? This is maybe eight to 10%, but who cares, right? This is just for visualization. If we were doing some sort of high fidelity physics simulation where we really cared, then okay, we would spend the time in the cycles to compute the root sum of squares here. For us, we're just trying to see that the FFT is spiking at the cricket chirp frequency. So a handful of percent approximation is fine for us. A good trick to know for video games. Good trick to know for video games. If you don't, if it's just a computer graphics thing, you're just trying to get an illusion or an effect or an approximation, these little tricks get you, they're really worth exploiting. Okay, that's what I've got to, for today. So starting next week, we're going to start talking about synchronization.